later on down the road, welcome as well. I'm Wombat, Allen Guard, and today I'm going to be uh, going over ship fitting and basics behind ship fitting. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me very well? I'm going to make sure that I'm. Uh, I think that's a bit better. Anyway, so we're going to uh, be discussing ship fitting and the basics behind ship fitting. Um, we're going to start off here just by uh, discussing the Empire Doctrines, and uh, then we'll follow um, with the Pirate Factions. We'll just briefly touch on those. We'll look at the basic types of ships. We'll cover Combat, Logi, E-War, Exploration, Tackle, etc. We'll look at the Destroyers, the Cruisers, the Battle Cruisers, the Battleships. Once we're done with that, we'll uh, look into how to read into ships via the traits and their skills that are required. Um, and then that'll bring us into Fitting. We'll go over the fitting window, all the different uh, parts of the fitting window, how to read the fitting window. Um, we'll look at modules, um, different types of modules, how to find modules, how to understand which modules you want to use. And then we'll kind of look at how to go about fitting a ship, um, some procedures and kind of tactics to uh, fit ships and uh, make a good fit, and then how to read the pros and cons of a fit. And uh, then that should be the end of the class. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can. <clears throat> so we're going to first all start off, we're going to go up here to the Neocon menu, which is in your upper left hand corner, it's got the little E symbol. Clicking this will bring up a list of all the different items and tools that uh, you can find in the game. And if you head to the ship tab, you'll notice there's fitting and ship tree, and these are going to be the two tabs that we're probably going to spend most of our time in when it comes to fitting. Um, you can access these from here, however, um, what I've done is I've already dragged them, click and drag them to my sidebar. And that will allow me to uh, access it at any given time from the sidebar. Um, so if we go ahead here and we're going to click the, uh, the ship tree, this is going to bring up um, pretty much all the ships in the game, with the exception of a couple. Um, and we're going to start off here, up here in the kind of upper left hand side, you'll see there's all these little icons. These are all the different factions in the game. And this is how you can easily access each tree in each faction tree. And you'll notice right away, if I click on the Amar Empire, it brings up this little square here. And in here, it gives me a kind of a little brief overview of the Amar Empire's doctrine. It tells me that they excel at engagements using energy turrets backed up by drones, and they prioritize armor over speed. So this tells me that they're going to be kind of slower, but they're going to be very heavily armor tank. They're going to use energy turrets and drones. And you'll notice these icons here, if I hover over them, it gives me more more things to kind of look at, more stuff that would tell me a bit more about the doctrine. So it tells me here right away energy turrets, it tells me shields, it tells me drones, it also tells me energy destabilization and weapon disruption. And this basically kind of tells me they're at war. And as you filter through and check out the other factions, you'll notice it's kind of a similar concept. Um, so the Kaldari State's doctrine is all about missiles and hybrid turrets, and they love to shield tank, and they'll prefer sh uh, beefier shields over speed. Um, it tells us that the uh, E-War is ECM, or Electronic Countermeasures. They use hybrid turrets, missiles, and shields. We go on to Galante. It tells us Galante is all about uh, hybrid turrets and drones, um, and they like to kind of balance their armor and speeds. So they're, they're much faster than the Amara ships. And finally, we're going to look at Minmatar, and they're kind of an interesting faction. Um, they do have projectile turrets, and they kind of use armor and shield and speed, all three of them at once, and each ship's a little bit different. You'll notice that um, their E war here is stasis webify, and they've got target tanking as well. So they've got a different type of E war. So Amar, Kaldari, Galante, and Minmatar make up the four major empires in the game, and they probably have the largest ship trees in the game, as you can clearly see here. Um, and they'll each faction, when it comes to their ship tree, kind of has a slightly similar approach to things, and you'll notice it. It's most common with the Tech 1 frigates. Every single one of the four Empire factions will have at least one Logi ship, one e ship, one Tackling ship, one Exploration ship, and two Combat ships. So if we look here at Amar, we've got the Crucifier. This is their um, weapon disruptor, so this is going to be an e ship. If we look over here, this is their Magnet. It's got bonuses to core and combat scanner probes. This is their Exploration frigate. Ex uh, ex executioner, it's got propulsion jamming system bonuses. This is going to be the tackler. We've got the punisher. This is one of the combat ships. It's all the bonuses are based towards tanking and dealing damage. Same thing with the uh, 
with the Tormentor here. It's all towards dealing damage. Um, the Inquisitor here has remote armor repair bonuses. This tells us it's a Logi ship. And so if you go through and you look at each of the different empires, you'll notice that it's all kind of similar. You know, we've got here we've got an Eeyore ship, and this is a tackling ship. Here's a, an exploration ship, and you've got a combat ship, combat ship, and a Logi ship. And so it, all six of these frigates between each empires will kind of follow the same idea. There's going to be a tackler and that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> all of these ships will have a Tech 2 variant or two Tech 2 variants in some cases. We're not going to really touch into Tech 2 variants, but basically Tech 2 variants sort of uh, are enhanced situational ships. They're very powerful for their purpose, and they're not very good for other situations. Um, for example, if you look at the Assault Frigates, I've got the Hawk, which is all about light missiles, and we've got the Harpy, which is all about hybrid turrets, and they're very good at you know, tanking lots of damage or dealing lots of damage, but that's about it. They're not very good at tackling, they're not very good at exploration, they're not very good at anything else really other than dealing damage. So Tech 2s are kind of uh, the more powerful versions of the Tech 1 ships. Um, if we go over here to uh, destroyers, most destroyers in the four empires will kind of split. There's two two Tech 1 destroyers, and one will follow sort of one path of the doctrine, the other one will follow the other path. So if you look here at the um, Minmatar ships, um, they've got bonuses to missiles, whereas the Thrasher's bonuses to projectile turrets. So it's kind of one's one weapon type, the other one's the other weapon. The other big dif difference you'll notice, and this is what I was getting into late uh, earlier on about how the Minmatar has both shield and armor. If you look here at the Thrasher, you'll notice it's only a shield ship, so you can really only fit shield modules with it. But if you look at the Palwar, you'll notice you can do armor or shields, so you can kind of choose how you want to fit your ship to tank. Um, when we get over here into cruisers, um, it's sort of a s roughly similar idea with the frigates, although there's a little bit more leeway, um, and each empire is quite a bit more different here. Um, but again, they'll have a ship dedicated to following a specific part of the doctrine. So we've got here the Bellicose, this is a target painter, so it's kind of a damage and, and E-war focus ship. Target painters basically increase the signature radius, which allows them to apply more damage. Um, we've got the Rupture here, which is all about projectile turrets. Um, then we've got the Stabber, which again is projectile turrets. It's two different kinds of, if you look at it, this is damage and rate of fire. This is rate of fire and fall off. So this is kind of allowing you to increase your range and, and shoot from a further distance. And then finally, of course, the Skype, which is a logistics drone, or a logistics ship, sorry. And you'll notice that when it comes to logistics, there's um, the Tech 1, Tech 2 frigate logistics ships. There's Tech 1, Tech 2 cruiser logistics frigs, uh, ships. And you don't get a logistic ships until we get into the capital ships, but we're not going to uh, be talking about capital ships today. Um, next, we have battle cruisers. Um, battle cruisers are kind of an, an interesting ship in the game. Um, all battle cruisers can fit a command first, which is basically an item that, when you cycle it, it gives us kind of a burst that provides a bonus to certain attributes um, based off what command burst you have. So there's bursts that increase your shield. Uh, HP amount or your armor HP amount. Uh, there's bursts that can increase your speed. Um, there's there's quite a variety of bursts, and these are kind of things to kind of enhance or augment a fleet. Um, they're not very good for solo flying. They're kind of more so for fleet. But that's kind of the unique thing about battle cruisers is that they can fly this. The only other ship that can do this um, in the sub capital is the command destroyers, and that's a Tech Two uh, destroyer. Um, the other thing you'll notice about battle cruisers is that one of the battle cruisers is going to have battleship sized weapons. Um, the other two battle cruisers are going to be, you can see here, medium projectile turrets. Uh, here's heavy missiles. Um, if we go over here to Amar, you'll see we've got large energy turrets. This is a battleship focused one. This one's medium energy turrets and drones. So there's going to be one battle cruiser in each of the four empires. It's going to have weapons from the battleship class, and that's going to bring us into our battleships. And there is sort of here, there's no real set way of how the empires have their battleships. For example, if we go to Calgary, they've got an E-War battleship. If we go to Galante, they don't. They've got a hybrid turret focus ship. They've got a drone focus ship and another hybrid and armor repair focus ship. So they have no E-War ships in the Tech 1 area. Um, once we get to Tech 2, then we start to see a bit more of the E-War coming in. Or maybe not. 
is an incorrect about that. Regardless, the battleships are kind of different. Each faction has their own way of doing battleships. However, you're guaranteed to have at least two dedicated combat battleships in each of the uh, in each of the empires. So that was just kind of a brief overlook of the empires. Uh, you opened up the ship window and you click here, and you can kind of see all the different uh, traits and skills of each one. And then that's going to lead us on to the rest of these. And we're not going to spend as much time in these. I'm just going to kind of briefly go over these. And um, These are basically the faction ships. So they're not the four major empires. There are other factions within the game. So this is Ore, or Outer Rim Excavations. And they're a company that's kind of dedicated towards mining. And so because of that, all their ships are mining ships. They've got uh, the Venture, which is the Tech 1, the only uh, Tech 1 ship that a Alpha character can fly from Ore. And uh, it's all about mining. It's all about mining. And you'll see the expedition frigates, they're all about mining. And the barges are all about mining. It gets a little bit different down here. Um, these industrial ships here, these command ships, um, they provide bursts, mining bursts. Um, except for this guy here, the Nakas. This is all about salvage. Um, you can see here in these bonuses, he's all focused towards uh, salvaging ships. These guys here, these three here, the Oracle, the Orca, and the Porpoise, they're all about providing boosts for a mining fleet to enhance a mining fleet. Um, finally, we've got uh, these uh, the pirate factions down here. Now, the pirate factions are kind of a unique uh, sort of way of, uh, uh, of doing the ship. And basically, the easiest way for me to explain it is you'll notice here they have the icons of two empires. And basically what's happening is in order to fly the ship, you have to have the skills from both relevant empires. So here's the worm, which is the Uristas. And in order to fly it, I have to have the Kaldari frigate skill and the Galante frigate skill trained up. As a result, you'll notice that it takes something from each of those major empires. In this case, the worm takes drones and missiles and shields. Um, so the drones come from Galante and the missiles and shields come from Kaldari. And they all kind of follow the same idea. For example, this is a Minmatar and an Amarian. So it's going to be using energy turrets and stasis webifying and energy neutralization. So that's um, the webifying is Minmatar and then the energy turrets and the energy destabilization is an Amarian thing. So these pirate factions kind of take something from both of the two uh, empires that you have to have skills in in order to fly. And they're, they're, they're pretty powerful ships really at the end of the day. Um, they're also kind of situational ships, and we'll get kind of into that a little bit later. We carry on here. Now we're going to look at these Sisters of Eve, or the SOE ships. And these are um, some of the best exploration ships in the game. They're also a little bit different from the other pirate factions because they have bonuses that aren't related to any of the factions that they're a part of. So as you can see here, you need Amar and Galante skills to be able to fly these. And they do have drones and armors, which is Amar and Galante. But they've got a lot of skills related to hacking and scanning and exploration. And that's why these are very, very good exploration ships. They're some of the best exploration ships in the game. Um, the Astero is probably the best one in the game. I think it's actually the best one in the game. Um, the Stratius is pretty good, but you're kind of getting into the bigger ships, a bit more brawly. Um, and then finally you get the Nestor, which has some remote armor repairs and some energy turrets. But basically, these, these ships are a little bit different because they have bonuses that are focused toward exploration. None of the other faction, um, none of the other factions in the game really have it, aside from the four empires who have a Tech 1 and a Tech 2 exploration ship. But that's kind of what the SOE ships and what kind of makes them different. We have Mortis Legion Command, and in lore, they are different because they're mercenaries, they're not pirates. Um, but the same thing applies to them as the other ones. They pull from, in this case, Galante and Caldari. Um, you see warp scrambling, warp disrupting, bone missiles, um, that kind of stuff. Um, Triglavian and Edencom, these are two very, very different. They have their own skills, their own ship skills that you need to train, their own weapon skills. They're kind of their own class. And for those of you who kind of relatively keep up with lore, will know that Triglavian Collective invaded several, was it two years ago maybe? And just recently Edencom was formed to fight them. So they're kind of uh, two factions that are at war against each other. And they have very, very different weapon systems from any other faction in the game. Um, the Triglavians have what we call entropic disintegrators. And basically what these are is they're a damage spooling um, uh, ship. So what this basically means is that um, 
as it cycles, so as the entropic disintegrator cycles, every cycle it does, it's going to increase the damage it puts out. So if we look here, damage multiplier bonus per cycle. So every cycle, the damage is increasing by 5% to a maximum of 150% of the original damage. And so basically, these ships are all about sustained fire. The longer you keep fire, the longer you maintain contact with an enemy ship, the more damage you can do. And they're also very, very good ships. They all have bonuses to promote armor repairs and energy needs. So they're very good in groups. They're incredible survivability in groups, and they can uh, deal a lot of damage. And because of their remote faster bonuses, or their armor repair, remote armor repair bonuses, they're always going to be flying in groups, which is kind of why Edencom's primary weapon is the Vortron Projector, which is a chain reaction. It uh, fires one shot at a target, and it can bounce around and hit several other targets. Um, so that's kind of a, a unique thing about these two factions. They have their own weapon systems that they've developed. Um, the other, all the other factions kind of share similar weapon systems. You'll find the same five weapon systems across them all, except for these two. They have their own weapon systems. Um, cool. So that was a quick look here into the Empire Doctrines and whatnot. Um, we are going to uh, sort of focus a bit more here now into the actual ships. Um, we're going to read, kind of look a little bit more into how to read into a ship, how to understand its purpose, um, how to understand what you should be fitting it for. Um, and we're going to do that by, I've kind of talked about a little bit, I've kind of been, you know, telling you guys about this. These are uh, the bonuses to the ship, or the traits. And if I go here and show info, you'll see it's in the traits tab over here. And this basically tells me what the ship's purpose is um, within the game or within a combat situation. So for example, the Incurse is here. You can see it's got a 7.5% bonus to armor repair amount and a 5% bonus to small hybrid turret damage. So really what it's telling me is that if I fit this ship with an armor repair, it's going to repair more armor than if it was fit to another ship. And the hybrid turret damage, hybrid turrets are going to do a lot more damage. Now, those of you who are observant will notice this little sentence up above, Galante Frigate Bonuses per skill level. So if I open up my skill sheet here, and I go to Spaceship Command, and I find Galante Frigates, you will see, uh, where is it, I have level 3 in that. So that means 5 times 3 is 15%. That means when I'm in this ship, any hybrid turrets I put on are, fifth, are doing 15% more damage. If I had this at level 5, this would be 25% more damage. So that's what we refer to as a skill trait, because it's based off of a skill. The higher the level in that skill, the more it's going to do for you. So this is basically saying that if I have level 5, I'm able to tank a lot of stuff in an active tank fit. And we'll get into the difference between active and passive tank fits once we actually start fitting the ship. The other type of bonus is a roll bonus, as you can see here in the Atron. A roll bonus is inherent to the ship, and your skills will not affect it. So this one here, it's an 80% reduction in propulsion jamming system. So this is basically stasis weather fires and warp disruptors and warp scramblers. And what this means is that when I put them on there, it's going to take 80% um, less CPU to, 80% less capacitor to cycle it. So it makes it very easy for you to fit a variety of these propulsion jamming modules, and it's going to be low, low drain on your capacitor. And we'll get all into this stuff. It'll all make a lot more sense once we actually start fitting it. But basically, these skill bonuses are dependent on your skill level, whereas roll bonuses are always going to be like this. So a good example is if we look at a lot of these faction ships, you'll notice they've all got roll bonuses. This one here is 150% bonus to small energy turret damage. That means that if someone who has um, level one in small energy turrets, if they get into the ship, it's still going to increase their damage by 150%. If they have level five and they get into the ship, it's still going to increase their damage by 150% and then stack it on top of whatever their current skill level is, if that makes sense. Um, and so what these rule bonuses are, are kind of useful for is telling us what the specific role is for the ship in that game. So a lot of these, sh um, and the skill bonuses would be the same thing. So when you're looking at choosing a ship for a job, it's important to take both of these skills into mind and understand
how they're going to be useful. Um, so another thing that we can look at here um, is if we right click on ship, go show info and go attributes, we can learn a lot more about the ship here. We can learn all of its hit points, we can learn its resistances, we can learn all the information about the capacitor. Um, all of this information here kind of seems like a lot, but don't worry, we're going to break it down because the next step, uh, once you kind of have a look through the ships and you understand all the different types of ships and what they do, um, the next step is to go into the actual fitting. And um, this is going to begin sort of our uh, process to um, uh, to fit a ship. But before we do that, I want to have a quick look at this. This is the fitting window. And again, you can access it through the Neocom menu and go to Ships and Fitting right here. However, I have it dragged to my sidebar over here, so I can access it quickly. And this is uh, probably the most important tool when it comes to fitting a ship. And there's a lot going on in here. Um, don't worry, it's all actually quite simple. So in the very center of the ship, you have your ship. And it's in a holographic form because I'm currently simulating it. If I exit the simulated mode, will bring me into the current ship and everything that I have packed to the, uh, fitted to this ship. But I don't quite want that yet. I want the simulated window fit. So we're going to start off um, just by, so here's the ship, and then in a circle around it, you'll see there's a bunch of different squares and all sorts of stuff going on. This is basically all the things that are going to be fitted to the ship. So starting at the top, this is all of our high slots. So if you ever hear us referring to a module as a high slot, this is what we're talking about. Um, most common high slot we uh, items are going to be uh, any weapon systems, so turrets and drones, uh, turrets and launchers. And you can see up here on this ship, I have two turret hardpoints. And if I open up, say, a rogue, and I simulate this, you'll see I have a lot more hardpoints up here. So now I have eight turret hardpoints, and I have four launcher hardpoints, and I have a lot more space up here. Um, so this is where most of your weapons go, and there's a few other modules that will fit up here. Um, next is our mid-slots. Um, this is kind of, uh, there's a lot that can fit in here, um, anything from propulsion to propulsion jamming. Um, all shield-related modules are going to fit in here. Um, there's some capacitor battery stuff that can be fit in here. There's there's really quite a variety of modules that can be fit in here. And then we have our low slots, and this is where all of our armor-based modules are going to be fit, um, as well as um, any modules directly related to weapon enhancement are going to be located down here. Um, so that's kind of the biggest difference is all the uh, shield-based ships. You're going to find all your shields are up here, and all the armor-based ships, most of your armor modules are going to be down here. And finally, we have rigs up here. And rigs are sort of like the spice on the soup or the salt in the soup. They um, allow you to enhance or um, cover weaknesses in the ship. And they're, they're kind of a hard thing to get used to, but I do have a few tips that make it quite easier to understand how to fit rigs. Um, but you can't just fit any module on here. Um, there's a few things that come into effect. And the most common ones is your ship limitations. So if we look down here, you'll see there's kind of a sort of like a ruler, a curved ruler down here. And this is our power grid and CPU. The CPU is everything starting from this thicker bar and going up. If you hover over it, you can see it's CPU. And then this everything from the thicker bar down is our power grid. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is our calibration. Calibration only affects rigs, but it's kind of the same idea. As we start dragging and dropping modules onto the ship, you'll see um, a red line here and a blue line here, and these kind of dictate our CPU and power grid being used up. As you can see, I have 975 units um, available in my CPU, and I have 19,312 units in my power grid available. As I put modules on, these will disappear. Um, and this is, uh, this is a very big part of the fitting. A lot of ships you'll find you're limited by how much power grid and CPU you can use. Um, the next thing is everything on this left hand side. Um, this is the same stuff that you could find in your attributes page, it's just it's a lot easier to kind of filter through it here. This is our capacitor, so for those of you who've played for a while, you know that the capacitor is kind of down here in the center of your screen, and as you activate modules, 
it will disappear. It will drain. The capacitor is a liberal battery. It's your current power reserve. And it's charged up by the basically the engines in the ship. They charge it up. And so right now you can see I'm stable, which means that I can basically fire my weapons forever, but I have no weapons. If I was to fit weapons on here and I was to stay cap stable, what that means is that I can use all of my modules indefinitely, as long as I have ammo for them. Sometimes, and most often, you'll find you can't actually stay cap stable. Um, and what that means is that all of your modules being activated is too much drain on your capacitor, and eventually the capacitor will deplete, deplete and you won't be able to use those modules. Um, there are ways of uh, kind of dealing with that and handling that. Um, and it's all to do with how you fit. Next we have our offense. Um, this is basically just how much damage you put out. Uh, we have DPS, which is uh, the potential damage. It's how much damage you can apply in a second. And then we have the alpha strike, which is how much damage you will deal in a single cycle. Um, and this is a very important thing in PvP. In PvE it's less so. Um, as long as you're dealing a lot of damage, you're good. Um, but there is a big difference between DPS and um, Alpha Strike, and we'll get into that and we'll kind of show the differences between them with a few different ships. Next we have Defenses. This is all of your um, armor shield structure. It's basically how your survivability is more or less what it is. Um, you can see here this is my shield. This is how much shield I'm regenerating. Keep in mind, shields will passively regenerate on their own. Armor will not and structure will not. Um, so with this ship, you can see here that it's recharging 15 shield points a second um, with a pool of 11,687, which will completely recharge in 1,875 seconds, which is a very long time. You can see the amount of armor I have and the amount of structure. These are our resistances, and these are basically um, a big part of tanking-ish. Um, basically, every weapon in the game will do a certain type of damage. Um, some types of weapon systems, you can't change it. You're forced to shoot a certain type of damage, like uh, the Amarian en energy turrets. They are kind of limited to thermal and energy. Um, you get to the projectiles, you get to missiles, you get to drones, you can start to dictate which type of uh, damage type you want to deal. But basically, when you're looking at these uh, resistances, the higher the resistance, the less of that type of damage you're going to uh, take. So for example, if I was to take the ship out, as it is right now, and I was to be shot at by someone with a missile, I have the highest in explosive damage resistance and the lowest in shield, uh, or in EM damage. So if someone is to shoot at me with one explosive missile, it would do far less damage than if they were to shoot at me with uh, a, an EM missile or a Mjolnir missile. So resistances are quite important, and they're very different for each faction. Um, so for example, Kar Kaldari is typically very weak in the shield. You get to other factions where they're armor-based, and now it's the explosives is kind of where you want to, uh, to be worried about. And it just kind of depends on which uh, doctrine type they have. Finally, we have targeting. This is kind of, uh, kind of a hard thing to understand, and I don't really even fully understand it. Um, but the mechanics behind it anyways, basically targeting is um, when you cycle up and target a ship. And for those of you who have flown larger ships, you'll know that battleships targeting frigates takes much longer than frigates targeting frigates. Um, that's because scan resolution and your um, sensor strength. Um, this here, this little number here, just basically tells you how many block targets you can have up. Um, and it's kind of dependent on skills and on the ship itself. Some ships are inherently only allow you to block so many targets. Next we have navigation. Um, this is all about your speed. Um, this here is your total maximum velocity. This is my align time, so how fast it takes me to get to warp. Um, my warp speed, uh, all, sorts, all that kind of stuff related to my navigation. Then finally drones here. This tells me um, my bandwidth, um, how many I have active, the range, and their DPS. And the last thing I forgot to mention up here is EHP, effective hit points. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't believe I forgot about this. This is a very, very important part of fitting a ship. This takes into effect all of your resistances and total health points of all your three different types of um, uh, tanking areas. Um, so, for example, this ship is almost 50,000 EHP. That's kind of a combination of all these different uh, 
health pools and resistances. So that's a very, very important, uh, important number to keep your eye on. And then the last few things down here, you can see you've got your cargo hold, your drone bay, um, and then finally up here, this is your sort of your ship main thing. So um, what this is is if anybody ever asks you to link a fit, basically what you do is you open up your ship fitting and you click this name up here and you can click and drag it into the chat and hit enter and it instantly drops the fit for them to see. Um, so that's kind of a cool way you can change your name to as well there. The next thing we're going to get into over here is the holes and fits and the hardware. Um, this is also a very useful thing. So the holes and fits first is basically where you can find fits for the ship. Um, now right now I have it limited to my personal fittings. So if I filter it by the hole, you can see I've got a few different fittings for the Astero. If I get rid of that and I filter it by corporation, you can see all the fittings that we have for the corporation. Um, so these are all of the corporation fittings that we have for this ship. Um, so if you're ever kind of looking for a specific fit for a ship, check the corporation fittings first. Oftentimes there's a fit for it. If there isn't, let us know. We can help you. You can also filter by skills, so only show the ships that you have the skills to fly. Um, next we have the hardware, and this is going to be the biggest part of fitting a ship, because all of your stuff is in here, everything. You've got your modules, and then you've got charges. Um, and again, it's the same idea. We can filter by what we are restricted on the ship. So this is a small ship, so you can only fit small modules. I can also filter by skills, so only show the modules I have the skills to use. And then finally, we have all the different. So we have the low slot, mid slot, high slot, rigs, um, and drones. And um, basically, um, when you're looking at fitting a ship, it's kind of an understanding of those traits we talked about beforehand. So I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to open up the ship tree and I'm going to grab a random Galante ship. I'm going to go with the Algos. So the Algos is a destroyer and its traits tell me that it's drone hit points and damage, small hybrid turret tracking speed, and drone max velocity. So this is a drone boat. So I know right away that I'm going to want to focus a lot of my fits towards the drone. I have up here, I have five hard points, but I have one, two, three, four, five, six high slots. So I know I can fill all my high slots up with hybrid turrets and still have an extra slot. So I know if I go and load up a bunch of drones into my ship, I will have drones. So this is the most, uh, oh, I didn't do it quite right. This is what the ship is dedicated towards is drones. So now you can see down here my drone DPS has gone up. I have 65 uh, DPS for my drones. And I have a drone control range of 48 kilometers. So I'm going to right away, I know that because I'm using drones, this is going to be a drone ship. I want to take as much advantage of the drones as possible. So I'm going to go to my high slots and I'm going to add a drone upgrade, which is a drone link augmenter. This is going to allow me to launch my drones out to 68 kilometers, so I have a much bigger uh, control range. Because I now have the drone control link, I'm going to fit the rest of the high slots with some blasters, some medium blasters. Uh, we'll just load these guys up. And now I have a bunch of blasters on. And I've run into a few problems right away first one that I'm sure some of you have seen is I don't have the skills for the blasters. I don't have medium hybrid turrets. I can't use the blasters. Second thing you're going to notice, my power grid is overloaded by a lot. So this is what I'm talking about. You can see now there's a bit of coloring in here. This tells me what I can and cannot fit based off this. And this is either because my skills aren't high enough or because the ship itself doesn't have enough for me to fit. Um, Kind of, a, kind of a hard thing to learn how to do. You'll also notice the capacitor has started to decay. So I'm still cap stable, but I'm not at full capacitor anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unfit the modules, and I'm going to realize, OK, I don't have the right skills for this ship. I'm going to back out, and I'm going to choose another ship. I still want a destroyer. Um, so I'm going to flip over, and I'm going to grab a destroyer that I know I can use, because I know I have the skills for it, a, a Corax. So I'm going to simulate the Corax. 
I'm going to bring it up, and now things are a little bit different. I have turrets instead, and my focus is on turrets. So I'm going to open up my missiles, and I'm going to grab light missile launchers, and I'm going to drop a whole bunch of light missile launchers onto it. And a little bit of a process behind fitting, I always start with the weapons, because it's sort of the whole point of the ship. If you're not dealing any damage, you're not going to be able to do anything if that makes sense. Like if you have a ship that has no weapons and you go into a mission, well you can't complete the mission. So weapons are very important. So I always fill my high slot up with weapons first. And this gives me an idea of what I can do. So now you can see I've consumed more than half of my power grid and a good chunk of my CPU. And missiles are what we call a mechanical firing weapon. So they don't use faster. Um, the projectile turrets from Minmitar are the same thing, they won't use capacitor, but hybrid turrets and energy turrets will use the capacitor. They are energy-based weapon systems, so they will use the capacitor. So you'll find with a Mars ship, so as soon as you put your weapon systems on, you'll have a lot of capacitor drain. So Mars ships tend to be a little bit more uh, capacitor management than Kaldari ships, at least until we put shields on, but we're not quite going to worry about that yet. So I've got uh, a full rack of missiles on here now. And the next step to do is to look at our survivability and our tank. So if I look up over here, you'll notice the cor uh, the Corax has absolutely no shield resistances, and I want to take care of that. But I'm not going to take care of it yet. I'm going to save a rig slot for that, and there's a reason why I'm going to do that. And the reason is because if I go and put a shield module to cover that resistance, I am now one slot less on my... Um, mid slots, and I don't know what I need in my mid slots quite yet to be able to uh, to fly the ship the way that I want it. So I'm not going to put that on quite yet. I know I can use a rig slot to cover that, so I'm just going to hold off and see how things work. The next thing I'm going to take care of is propulsion. Um, I want to put on a afterburner. I'm just going to put on a one and an afterburner. Nothing fancy, but it'll get us going quite a bit faster than before. The next step I want to do is put on some shields. So let's put on some shield boosters. Let's put on a small shield booster and see what happens. So I have a small shield booster on. It's barely affected my power grid, but it has affected my CPU. And now you'll notice my capacitor is now going to deplete in a minute 40 seconds with all of these launchers activated. If I deactivate the afterburner, you'll see I've got 2 minutes and 16 seconds left. That's still not a lot of time. Um, so now I, I know that my capacitor is kind of bad, a bit of an issue, right? It's so maybe not quite the best. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the mid slots, and we're going to go to engineering, and we're going to pull out a capacitor recharger. And we're going to see if a capacitor recharger gives us much time. If it doesn't, we'll put a capacitor battery. A small capacitor battery. That gives us not quite that much more time but it does it gives us a bit more time so we're going to put a capacitor battery on that allows us two minutes of shield cycle and now i'm kind of at a bit of an unknown situation because my capacitor is not doing super well i still have a mid slot for my tank but i still have two low slots and rigs to do so what do i go about doing now well i'm going to quickly uh see what else i can do with this mid slot so i'm going to grab fields again this time, though, instead of doing something active, I'm going to do something passive, like a shield extender. Shield extenders will basically just increase my base amount of BHP. So let's jump that up. It's not going to affect my CPU. It will uh, my power, uh, my capacitor. It will affect my CPU and power grid. So now I have an active tank module. I have a module to increase my overall tank. My next step now is to focus on my low slots. I have quite a few variety of items I can put in my low slot. Um, I'm going to focus on turrets and launchers because I have missile launchers up here. I'm going to put a... Uh, missile guidance complete. I'm going to put one of these on. Oh, not enough. Oh, that's why. See, I still have my missile. I've got to switch to a low slot. Now I've got my low slot. There we go. Now I can put a ballistic control missile on. This is going to increase my damage from these ships. I'm going to save this last low slot just in case I run into a bit of trouble with my power grid. 
And this is something that kind of comes from experience. I'm going to now focus on rigs. And earlier I stated how I was low on the EM damage. This is where I'm going to use it. I'm trying to use my rigs to kind of cover a few of these weaknesses. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to grab a Tech 1 small EM screen reinforcer. And that's going to boost my EM up. So now my resistances are at a spot where I'm more or less comfortable. Now I want to take care of this capacitor. I want to see if I can get this capacitor up. So I'm going to run down the list and see which modules affect the capacitor the most. And I'm going to notice that the Tech 1 small core defense capacitor safeguard is going to do that. So I'm going to drag and drop two of these on here. As you can see, that gives me a lot more time with my capacitor. It gives me almost four minutes with my capacitor. Um, so I have my rigs up in a good spot. But the thing is, is that these two modules that I have are based towards the rigs. I don't want that. I want pure energy. And this is kind of the cool thing about the rigs, is there are rigs for everything. Um, there are shield rigs that, as you just saw, affect the capacitor. There's also dedicated capacitor rigs. There's um, dedicated rigs for drones. There's dedicated rigs for armor. Uh, rigs for energy weapons. Rigs for projectile weapons. Mining rigs. Targeting rigs. Um, there's quite a few rigs for everything. The problem with rigs, and I'm going to show you an example here, is that all rigs have a direct um, drawback. So if we read the description on this one here, it says that it, it increases the ship's power grid capacity. Um, maybe it's not this one. There are rigs. Let's see if we can find one. Oh, I know where they are. Here it is. This one here uh, increases the ship's CPU need for all power upgrade modules. Um, it decreases the CPU need. Um, rigs, boy, I've just lost my train of thought here. Um, Got to find it here for a second. There are rigs that have drawbacks, and there are skills. Really, here they are. Okay, shield rig. So this sh this rig here um, is going to de reduce the duration of shield booster cycles. So basically, if I put it on this shield booster will cycle in a shorter amount of time, but at the expense of increased signature radius. Um, and you can see here the drawback is 10%. There are skills to decrease that drawback, but basically what it means is that when I put that rig on, my signature radius is going to bloom and people are going to be able to apply damage to me better. So when you're looking at these rigs, you got to kind of keep in mind there is a bit of a drawback for some of these rigs. But I want to uh, want to see if there's an engineering rig rather than a shield rig that does a better job of covering my capacitor. So I'm going to scroll through here, and I'm going to see see if we can stick with tech one. This one here does it decently, so we're going to grab two of these on, and there we go. You can see before with the two shield-related capacitor rigs, it was only four and a half minutes. Now it's 11 minutes and 52 seconds. So I have rigs. I have my capacitor to spot that I'm okay with. I have one last low slot. My CPU and my power grid is fine, so I'm going to see if I can drag another control ballistic on. And finally, I'm just going to load up some charges into the missiles, and we will carry on. You can see my DPS up here. You can see I've kind of balanced out my resistances a bit more, and I've more or less taken care of everything. So my capacitor is not going to be cap stable, and in my experience in fitting ships, you rarely get capacitors to be cap stable. Um, if you do, you're trying very hard. Um, what what you have to do with the cap when it's unstable is you have to manage your modules. And as you saw there, I turned off the afterburner, and now I'm cap stable with the shield booster running. So when I'm flying the ship, I know I only use the afterburner when I need to move locations, and I only cycle the shield booster when I'm low on shields. Otherwise, I won't be cap stable. And I found Kaldari ships typically tend to be a little bit easier to manage some of these modules. Once you get into some of the other ships, you don't have to worry about CPU or power grid as much, but you do have to worry about capacitor. It's all kind of a bit of a game. I found EVE Online's quite balanced when it comes to this kind of stuff. The other thing I want to talk about here is you'll notice I have an active module. Um, there's two types of tanking in the game. There's active tank and passive tank. If I was to fit this for a pure passive tank ship, what I would do is I would fit all modules that don't have capacitor drain. So I already have a shield extender. So I would go here and I would grab a shield resistance amplifier and I would drop my EM on in here. And the reason why I do this, uh, unfit that, 
and we'll drag another shield extender on. And then with my rigs, I'll just go and add more shield rigs that just increase my sh uh, shield hit points. The difference between active and passive tanking, in my experience, and Admix, feel free to correct me on this, is passive tanks you have. So for example, this is a passive tank fit ship. So I have rigs to increase my EM resistances. I have modules to increase my total hit points. I have 7,678 EHP or effective hit points. When this is up, I'm dead. With an active fit module, you will all have modules that have capacitor drain. And which means that once people kind of do damage to you and they get through your shield, you can cycle your shield boosters and replenish that shield. Or if it's armor, you can cycle, or cycle your armor repairs and you can boost that armor hit points. I found that all of the active tank ships will tend to be a lot more strain on the capacitor, but you're able to tank a lot more damage for a lot longer of a time. With passive tank ships, once this this point is is out, I'm dead. With active tank ships, as long as my as long as I can manage my capacitor, I'm fine. And that's kind of a big difference between them. There are PvP fit ships that are pure active tank, and they can they can tank for a long time. But if they get a couple ships on them that start muting out their capacitor, they're not able to active tank as well. Whereas passive tank ships don't have to worry about that. But you only have so much health. You can't replace that health. So that's kind of um, a bit of a strategy behind the ships. Um, when I come to the fit to, to fitting a ship, I'm always looking at what are the skills, and more importantly, what what am I trying to do with this ship? What is my end goal with this ship? Um, if I wanted to go and do level four missions, I know level four missions are quite hard. So I'm not going to choose a frigate for that. I'm going to go and I'm going to choose a battleship. Even better if I can do a faction battleship, because they're more powerful. So a big part of fitting a ship is understanding what your goal is, understanding what you want to do with the ship, um, where you want to go. Is it PvP? Is it exploration? Is it missions? Is it Am I hauling ships? If I want to haul items, I'm going to need to grab an industrial ship to do that. Um, there's, there's kind of a, a big part of EVE Online, which is kind of researching the area that you're going into. With PvP, it's kind of hard to research what you're doing because you don't really know who you're going up against or what they're flying. But you can research your ship and you can get a better understanding of your ship. And all the PvE aspects, there's tons of resources online. Um, you can research it and know what you're getting into and then fit a ship for that. Um, ships are also situational. Um, I would never ever bring a Bantam in to do a level one mission because Bantams are useless at dealing damage. I would use a Bantam in a fleet com in a fleet set, uh, PvP or PvE, because I can boost and repair my enemy, my friendly shields. So the biggest step to uh, any type of fitting is to understand what your end goal is, what you want to do, and then selecting a ship that kind of uh, com com complements that. Uh, if I want to do missions, I want to choose a ship with with damage dealing capabilities and good survivability. I don't want to choose a tackle ship. They're fast and they're not really focused on dealing damage. If I want to go into PvP, um, if I'm doing it solo, again, I wouldn't bring a Bantam. I'd want to choose a ship that can, you know, hold its own. Um, and that kind of is why fleet, fleet doctrines, which we have in the Corporation Bulletins, are kind of interesting because um, there's a specific focus with all these ships, and when they're all together and all working, you're able to do quite a bit of damage, and that's because each ship was chosen for a specific reason. Um, if we look here at the Dragoon, the Dragoon has bonuses to energy nukes, and so Adenix chose the Dragoon as the uh, support ship because you can absolutely destroy people's capacitors. That was its focus. That was its purpose. He needed a ship that was able to cripple the enemy and the Dragoon is able to cripple enemies. It's able to cripple active tank ships, so it's a very powerful ship. So he chose the Dragoon because of the bonuses. He knew what he wanted, and he chose a ship to contemplate what he wanted. So when you're doing your fitting, you've got to understand where you want to go, and you've got to choose a ship to fit it. The second step is to understand the bonuses. Um, here with the Cormorant, you can see tracking speed and optimal range. This allows me to shoot from further, and allows me to shoot faster targets. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a, a, an experience 
kind of thing. You've got to play around with bits. You've got to kind of understand them. Once you start to get pretty good with it, you can start to blur the lines between ship roles. Um, for example, there is a time where we didn't have a scout for a fleet, so I grabbed the buzzard, which is the Tech 2 Kaldari exploration ship, and I fit it as a scout because it has bonuses to um, to scan, uh, to combat scan of probes. So there is a way that I was kind of able to blur the lines, but that's kind of advanced ship fitting. The whole point that I'm trying to get at here is you, you need to understand um, what your goal is. Once you understand your goal, it's that much easier to select a ship. And once you select a ship, you just you just start with start from the top. Literally start from the top and work your way around. And before long, you'll have a ship fitted. Um, the last thing I want to touch on before uh, I go and end this class um, is how to identify weaknesses in ships, the pros and cons of ships. So I'm just going to look here into my own personal fittings because I'm currently going through a lot of these fittings. So I'm going to grab this. This is a Raven fit that I have. And there's a lot going on in this fit. And so there's... The name kind of gives away the purpose of the fit. It's called Structure Bash for a reason. I've got cruise missile launchers on. Um, I do have a few modules here, uh, stasis liquefiers and warp disruptors, that are good for pinning down and holding targets. But if I actually look at cruise missiles and I, and I go and I explore the modules and their charges and stuff, you'll start to quickly realize just in the stats uh, let's grab a missile here. That it doesn't apply damage very well to small targets. To big targets, absolutely. Really hurts them. But the big weakness with this ship is if I get attacked by a gang of, say, 15 frigates and destroyers, I am not able to apply damage as well. I have a stasis weather fire, which will slow them down, which will help me out. But I won't be able to do as much damage application if with these cruise missiles, um, I'd be better off with light missiles. So when you're looking at some of these ships, here's another one, the, uh, the Kestrel. Uh, where did it go? This one here. Seriously, seriously good damage um, I can get with this ship. There is a huge weakness with this ship, though, and that is range. Um, if I look at my missiles, 12 kilometers. I have used this fit in solo PvP, actually this specific fit, the Test 2, and the first fight I had with it was with a guy who had a range of 20 kilometers, and he was using a warp, uh, warp scram, uh, warp, yeah, he was using warp scrambler, same as me. So he had the range to pin me down, and he had the speed to stay out of my way. I was, I was using a micro warp drive, didn't matter. He had much more speed than me. Um, so the range with this one was kind of what got me. If I look at, uh, let's see if I still have the fitting for it. Maybe not. If I was using light missiles, here we go. Here's some light missiles. If I go and drop some missiles on here, you can see my range is massive. I can hit out to 60 kilometers. So in this situation, like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't have to worry about not being able to hit a target. I can hit them out pretty far. But I have capacitor issues. And even when I drop uh, the cap boosters in here, I'm pretty low on my cap stability, and so now if someone hits me with an energy newt, I'm done. I can't use my micro warp drive, I can't use any of these other modules that would normally assist me, and it's very easy for them to close the distance. So when you're trying to understand the pros and cons between a fit, I kind of have a, a rule of five. It's what's it, what is your range? Um, range and tracking is important if you're using a, a turrets. Um, what is my maneuverability? How fast can I go? How how easy is it for me to maneuver myself in a situation? Um, what are my, what is my survivability? In this case, it's EM. If someone starts hitting me with something hard with EM, you know that's my biggest weakness. Um, and the fourth and fifth one is what are their fits? What what are their pros and cons? What is their range? Um, I have found the biggest weakness for me in fighting in PvP is drones. I still don't really know how to counter drones very well. Um, that's that's a weakness. That's a weakness with a lot of Kaldari ships is drones. Um, some Kaldari ships require you to be very far away. Some require you to be very close. Just like with some of the Galante ships, the Incursus, you kind of have to be a bit more brawly. Drones are very easy to overwhelm you because you get focused on the ship. Do you now focus on drones? 
Like it, it's kind of hard. So you kind of have to understand that drones allow ships to have a ridiculous range. Um, so when it's understanding these things, is you got to look at what are you, what what is your range, what is your tracking, what is your survivability, how easy is it for you to maneuver, and what is the enemy's hitting. Um, some of the really good players are able to uh, look at an enemy ship and know what they're fit based off of the modules that they have fit. Um, I'll show you what I mean if I grab the Kestrel. If I zoom in on the Kestrel. Oh boy, if it lets me do it. Maybe it doesn't, there we go. Uh, maybe this one doesn't have fits, but when you zoom in on a ship in space, you'll be able to see the weapons themselves on the ship. And the really good players are able to identify differences between blasters and rail guns and rockets and missile launchers. And that's able to help them identify the, the type of weapon they're using, the range, the fits, all that kind of stuff. As a basis though, if you look at a ship and you start orbiting them from a distance, if they're trying to close distance on you, you know that they're, they're a close range fit. Um, and so it's kind of a bit of a, a skill thing is understanding how they're approaching the situation. But when it comes to identifying the weaknesses and fitting, again, a lot of it is down to understanding your own limitations. Um, if I grab this one here, this is a bit of a better ship because I have an energy need on it. And the energy nuke allows me to destroy smaller ships' capacitors and cripple them and hold them down. And a lot of smaller ships will have um, kind of rely on speed to escape some of the larger ships' tracking. And so the energy neutralizer allows me to, to prohibit this. Another big weakness with this ship, I don't know if any of you has noticed this um, yet or not, but um, I am very dependent upon this capacitor booster. Um, so right now, as you can see, I'm not cap stable in the slightest. If I drop a cap booster on, I'm now stable. But I can only hold six of these. And when they're gone, I'm done. So that was kind of a, another big thing that I was mentioning earlier with the uh, active tank ships, is once this one, once, your, once your capacitor gets destroyed, you're done. That's why energy nuking ships are so, so powerful. Um, so when it comes to kind of understanding weaknesses, you just really have to understand how far out can you hit enemies? Um, how easy is it for you to survive? What is your survivability, basically? Um, and once you understand those, your weaknesses kind of becomes a lot easier to understand. Um, the very last point I want to mention is the comparable tool. This is a very quick thing, um, but it definitely helps out a lot with a lot of uh, a lot of different things. So if I um, go here, and I'm just going to grab some. Uh, sure, blasters, mediums. You can see there's a ton of blasters. There's tons. Um, how do you know which one's best? How do you know which one you want to use? Which one's good for your situation? It is very overwhelming. There's an easy way to do it. If you right-click the module and click compare, it'll bring up a separate window, and you can just go through and load all of these up. And what this will allow you to do is compare them, weigh the pros and cons. Um, you've got a whole list of stuff on the left side here to select from. Um, Pretty much everything you could ever want to know about it. Um, rate of fire, power grid, uh, damage modifier, optimal range, turret tracking, accuracy fall off, active range, like everything you ever want to know about it. It's all laid up in here and you can sort them. So I want to know which one's the most expensive. The heavy neutron blaster is the most expensive. Okay, well, which one has the best damage modifier? Well, I can see here that heavy neutron has the best damage modifier. Which one has the longest range? Well, the heavy neutron has the longest range. Which one has the best tracking? Well, in this case, it's the heavy electron blaster. So using the compare tool, it's actually quite a bit easier for you to balance and weigh the pros and cons of certain modules. And, and uh, you can also use it with uh, charges as well. Um, so the compare tool I found when I first started really looking at ship fitting was, uh, was a very, very useful tool. Um, as time goes on, kind of starting to get a lot more used to modules, kind of know which ones I want to use. Um, for example, this one here, I can tell you my range bonus with the javelin N is disgusting, it's non-existent, um, but my tracking speed's a lot better. So use the compare tool if you're unsure about which modules or munitions are best, and um, that will help you quite a bit. Um, the last thing is I'm just going to point out a few modules that uh, are kind of interesting. Um, we'll, we'll start off here 
Uh, let's see if I can find. Yeah, automated targeting systems. These are very, 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 very situational. There's about three situations in Eve where you're use these. Um, every other situation, they will get you killed. Uh, stay away from these. Um, they're not. They're not going to help you out very much. Um, fleet assistant modules. These are what I was talking about before. The bursts. Um, you can kind of go through these on your own time, but there's armor, information, mining, shield, and skirmish. Um, armor is obviously armor, shield is shield. Skirmish is basically speed and maneuverability, and information is all to do with targeting and negating the effects of sensor damping and whatnot. Um, do electronic warfare. Um, we've got lots of different stuff in here. Um, earlier I was discussing here the warp scramblers and warp disruptors. Um, there's a big difference between warp scramblers and warp disruptors. Um, warp scramblers and warp disruptors are, they do the same thing ish. Um, as you can see here, I've got a warp disruptor. I have a range of 24 kilometers. And basically what this means is up to 24 kilometers, if I activate this module on a, on a ship, it will stop the ship from warping out. They cannot leave unless they get outside of that 24 kilometer range. The warp scramblers um, are a little bit different. They're a lot shorter range. If I grab the Type 2 one and we look at the attributes, it has a much uh, much shorter range, only 9,000 meters. Um, the biggest difference between scramblers and disruptors is that scramblers will shut down micro warp drives. Disruptors will not. Um, so if you're a ship and you're being disrupted, you can still micro warp drive around with a scrambler. No, they're going to shut you down. So kind of the big difference uh, between those. Um, these two are very common in PvP to lock people in. So um, Stasis webifiers and stasis grapplers, they slow the target down, as you can see here, it decreases the velocity by 55%. Um, very, very dangerous. Um, the slower you go, the easier it is to hit, as a general rule of thumb in EVE Online. The slower you go, the easier to, you are to get hit. Um, and then, of course, we have all sorts of different uh, EWAR. We have ECM, which basically disrupts their blocking. Um, we have uh, the, the weapon disruptors, which basically disrupts their weapon tracking, their missile um, tracking, uh, it, you can shut down the range, all sorts of things. We've got target painters. These uh, bloom their signature, which again, the smaller your signature, the harder it is for you to hit. Um, there's quite a, quite a lot going on. There's sensor dampeners here, which uh, will dampen your targeting and your, uh, um, uh, your targeting, sorry, here, which will basically make it, you can't target as far, you can't uh, target certain types depending on what type of sensor damping they have. Um, so EWAR is a pretty powerful thing. There are ships, as earlier that I said, that are dedicated towards it that are quite powerful. Um, and really, um, when it comes to fitting, just uh, go through here. Stay away from the auto-targeting system. They will get you killed. Um, only choose modules that you need. If you're not sure if you need it or not, drop it and keep fitting. Find something else that you need, more importantly. Um, again, that's why I was saying I always start from the top and work my way around because um, the top is all your all your damage dealing modules. You want to make sure that you can apply damage. Once you have that taken care of, then you focus on your tank. Then you focus on all the other stuff, and uh, that makes it pretty easy. And again, understanding weaknesses, it's all about how far out can you shoot, how well can you apply damage, how well can you survive tank. Um, how dependent are you on certain aspects like capacitors um, and uh, what is your enemy doing? Is he closing distance? Is he pulling distance? That will help you understand his weakness and yours. Um, if you're a ship that's based around long distance shooting and he starts closing speed, well, you might be in trouble. Um, one thing that is important to keep in mind, tracking speed, I did touch on a little bit earlier. Missiles don't worry about tracking speed. Um, you sh fire a missile, it's going to hit the target. Um, the smaller the target, the faster it's going, the less it's going to actually apply damage. Tracking is to turrets. Um, very, very important thing. Um, it's, 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 like, uh, it's like shooting a moving target. You're at the gun range and you have the little target that's moving across. The faster it's going, the harder it is to hit. 
but if you have a target that's moving super fast and it's right up in front of your face, you have to turn your entire body to keep up with it. The further the target is away from you, the less you have to move. It doesn't matter if how fast it's going, the further it is, the less you have to move. It's the same thing with turrets. Um, a turret that is built towards distance and range, so like a railgun for example, is able to hit targets at a very far range. If that target closes distance and starts orbiting you at a very tight distance, the tracking cannot keep up with it. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially with the turrets, is to, is to know the difference between uh, long range and short range, blasters versus railguns, beams versus pulse, uh, uh, auto cannons versus artillery. Um, if you're in a ship that is built towards long distance shooting and a target is very fast and they close distance on you, you've just lost most of your DPS. You're real lucky if you can hit them if they're right up next to you. Um, and then obviously on the opposite, if you have a ship that's tipped towards brawling and you're up and close and the enemy pulls range and you're not able to hit them, that's another big weakness. So it is very important with ship weaknesses to understand how you apply your damage. Um, are you long distance? Are you short distance? And once you understand that, then you know how you need to approach your targets. And that, that's regardless of PvP or PvP. If you have a long-range ship and you're approaching your targets really close, you can't hit them. You need to keep your distance if you're using uh, like artillery and, and, and real guns and whatnot. Missiles are different. They will. You don't have to worry about optimal ranges. You don't have to worry about fall-off. As long as it's there and as long as it's within range, you will hit it. Um, it's just how well will you apply the damage, which is why weather fires are quite useful because they slow the target down. They allow you to apply more damage. But again, um, the bigger the missile, the harder it is for you to hit small targets. These are cruise missiles, and they don't do very much against frigates. So you can imagine the XO, like the capital cruise missiles, they really don't do anything. Um, there's videos on YouTube of guys in dreadnoughts, and they're shooting at frigates, and they're doing like 50 damage because the missile just isn't applying damage. Um, and so yeah, that's basically the biggest thing about identifying weaknesses is what is your range, what are your range limitations, what is your tank, what is your survivability based off of, and what is your target, what is your target doing. Um, and again, use your compare tool, uh, filter through these modules, understand what you want. Um, don't try to don't try to make it super complicated. Don't try to make it uh, um, you know, complex, keep it simple. The simpler it is, the better you're better off until you start to get used to module management and then faster management, and then you can start to, to add more and more stuff. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, the best way of getting good at fitting is to just um, open up a ship that you have the skills for um, and just start fitting it. Um, for example, I've rarely fit hawks or harpies here, so. I might just simulate a fit and just fit it out and see what happens. See where you run into problems. Um, some ships you don't have to worry about power grid and CPU. Other ships, that's the first thing you run into is power grid and CPU use. So how do I go about that? Um, if you do run into CPU and power grid uh, problems, obviously there are rigs that will help you, but there's also low slot modules. Um, you've got power controls, you've got power diagnostic systems and reactor controls, and you've got co-processors that will all affect your CPU and power grid. And they, those kind of will help you to kind of augment that. So um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I hope I did a good job explaining um, how I go about fitting anyways. The process is understanding what you want to do and then choosing a ship that complements it. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to be around for a little bit longer. So you can feel free to ask away. And then in the future, uh, for those of you who are watching this later on down the road, do you have any questions regarding fitting, um, any questions regarding modules, feel free to ask them. Um, it's very important to read descriptions <laughs> when you're fitting modules to ships. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, I think that's going to wrap up the class. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, now's the time. Well, if there's no questions, then we'll end the stream, and uh, we'll see you guys out there. Fly safe.
Yeah, I appreciate it.